Welcome everyone. My uh, name is uh, Benjamin Herzberg. I'm from the World Bank and I lead the refugee investment and matchmaking platform at the World Bank. And I'm very happy to welcome you today for this webinar uh, on the topic of private sector for refugees. Uh, from knowledge to operation, how the private sector is adapting its work with refugees in a context of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'll be moderating this event together with my colleague, uh, Daphne young Derby, who is a uh, Director of Peace and Prosperity at the uh, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, with whom we are partnering for this uh, webinar. And I would like to thank everybody at the ICC, uh, all the colleagues who have shown uh, leadership in this topic and who are partnering with us and other partners to uh, host this event. So uh, thank you very much to the ICC for, for the hosting. So um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, why we're here today and what it is all about. So a little bit of background about the private sector for refugee initiative. And where did that come from? First, this is a partnership between uh, not only the World Bank Group and the International Chamber of Commerce, but also with UNHCR, with the European Investment Bank and the Confederation of Danish Industries. We came together as a group of partners because we thought that it was extremely important to see how we help the private sector play a stronger role for refugees. As you know, uh, refugees is uh, the refugee crisis is is really strong today uh, in the world. We have more than or about 80 million people that are possibly displaced, and most of the answer has been a humanitarian answer followed by a development answer. And we wanted to bring that one next step to what is a private sector answer because refugees need to be able to integrate economically and be empowered economically to not only have dignity, but contribute to the society, have a livelihood and be able to make it. And so um, we, what, what we did is we started by gathering uh, last year in Paris, in an international conference, all the organizations that were working on this topic of private sector for refugees. And during this, uh, this event in Paris in uh, 2019, what we did is we put together all that knowledge and we came up with, uh, on the spot through a, some kind of a hackathon, we came up with a charter of good practice that is distilling all the uh, good practice on the topic of private sector for refugees. And so this charter of good practice on the role of the private sector in economic integration of refugees go, goes through four key themes. And these are the themes that we are going to explore today. The theme of entrepreneurship, investment, employment, and also how do companies adapt their products and services to refugees. So we have for each of those topics, a number of key principles, but today we're gonna to look at how do we take those principles and translate them in practice. We push this agenda further at the Global Refugee Forum uh, in December 2019 in Geneva, where we met with more partners and we said, let's agree on how to push this agenda forward. This, what we call the PS4R agenda, private sector for refugees. Um, and we came up with two things. One is to push the global knowledge and two is to try to coordinate operations and innovations on the ground and foster partnerships between the private sector, government, uh, philanthropies, uh, development partners, um, business associations, business intermediaries, and all those people together, how we could push forward for this agenda. So we've advanced a lot on the knowledge side. For instance, there is an amazing uh, website that uh, was just launched and that we're announcing today, the website on private sector for refugee initiative and this is hosted by the ICC and Daphne will be presenting this a little bit later. But more importantly than the knowledge, the question is how do we take that knowledge and we translate it into 
innovations on the ground and concrete projects on the ground. And we started to look in all the different uh, partners that were working on this, what, what does this mean? If you're a private sector firm, what does it mean for you to be able to, to empower refugees and bring them in as employees or to deploy your product and services for refugees? If you're a government, how do you enable refugees to actually integrate into the society, become entrepreneur and unleash this amazing energy that they have to contribute to the place where they are right now? And so we have many partners who are working on this all together. Uh, we have partners that are here online today that uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, we have the Center for Mediterranean Integration, we have many others that are involved in this, but at the forefront of all this is the private sector. And we're going to hear today from a range of partners who are going to tell us about how they work to implement on the ground the PS4 agenda on employment, on entrepreneurship, on investment, and on product and services. On this, I will pass the floor now to my colleague, Daphne young Derby at the uh, International Chamber of Commerce, who is going to take us through the next step. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Benjamin, for that great, uh, that great introduction. Uh, um, as he mentioned, I'm uh, Daphne Ondebe. I'm director of um, Peace and Prosperity at uh, ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce. And um, I just like to join Benjamin in uh, wishing you a really warm welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. ICC joined the PS for our initiative because it believes that for societies to thrive, we need to be inclusive. And we also believe that everyone has the potential to make a positive contribution to communities in which they live. And those who find themselves in the position of being refugees or migrants are no exception and are generally more motivated than most to integrate and to contribute. Businesses have a really important role to play in providing economic opportunities for refugees through its expertise, its technology and networks. And many business organizations and companies in ICC's own global network around the world are already providing very concrete support in the areas of employment, entrepreneurship and investment, as well as adapting products and services to serve the refugee community. We were therefore extremely glad to have the opportunity to join forces with our partners in PS4R to help amplify the important role that businesses can play in the economic integration of refugees. As Bench mentioned, uh, the partners in the PS4R initiative are pushing to bring innovation to the fore and to stimulate new thinking on how the private sector can work more closely with refugees on the ground. And this is even more important in the COVID environment, which has disrupted many traditional models. Our event today really seeks to move the needle and to see how we can build on the sharing of knowledge and experiences that we've done to date to work towards creating operational impact on the ground. So to help us to do this, we've brought together leading speakers to touch on the four key themes that Benj mentioned uh, of our initiative, which are also in the chart of good practices, namely products and services, entrepreneurship, employment, and investment. And all our speakers have been asked to reflect on three main points. First of all, to tell their stories and to share the lessons learned on how best to leverage the private sector um, in integrating uh, refugees into the economy, how they have adapted to the challenges related to COVID-19, and then lastly, more forward-looking, how they would like to see the PS for our initiative moving forward. So we really look forward to getting practical suggestions from the speakers, but also from all of you participating in this event to help PS4R identify the best ways we can support the private sector in its work with refugees going forward. I'd also like to note that um, some of you know the Paris Peace Forum is taking place later this week, starting tomorrow. PS4R were very proud to have been selected by the forum this year as one of the projects which will be showcased. If you are attending, please do feel free to join the PS4R session 
where, ben, where you can see Benjamin yet again giving a 20 minute pitch on Thursday, uh, November 12th at six o'clock uh, CET, 12 noon EST, where uh, he will be summarizing the key outcomes of the event today and also be engaging with participants from the forum. Uh, another announcement, which Benjamin announced, uh, already uh, mentioned, is the fact that we now have a website for PS4R. This is hosted on the IC's platform, uh, and you can see it, uh, you will see the link on the slide. The, this site is intended to provide a knowledge sharing platform where we can showcase the different initiatives, which will allow all of us to learn from each other's experiences and ideas. We've engaged a wide number of institutions to showcase their work on the site and look forward to getting more. So please do share with us and also um, share any ideas you might have to improve this. So getting coming back to today's event, um, the presentations of our three, uh, our eight great speakers today will be structured around the four themes of the PS4R. So we'll have two panels on products and services on entrepreneurship followed by a brief Q&A. There will then be a very, very short break of a minute, followed by the next two panels on employment and investment and wrapping up with another Q&A. But before we start uh, introducing the speakers, I would like, first of all, uh, to share some messages from uh, the ICC Secretary General, John Denton, and the World Bank's Managing Director, Mary Pengestu, will be saying some words of welcome to you and also sharing some of their thoughts on the issues we'll be discussing. Thank you very much. We are seeing increasing nationalism and protectionism in the world today and the hostility of many places towards migrants and towards refugees. But the current pandemic has shown us one thing, and that is that no man or woman is an island to themselves. Everything and everyone is connected and we need to help others to be able to help ourselves. Experience has shown that when given the chance, refugees and migrants can and have made immense contributions to the communities in which they live. Businesses play a crucial role in helping refugees to integrate and add value to host economies. The private sector for refugees initiatives brings together businesses, the public sector and other stakeholders. Combining efforts will make individual endeavors stronger. Integrating refugees makes sense for business and makes sense for society. We look forward to working with our partners and with ICC's global network, our extraordinary network, to bring this to an end. If you would like to do the same, please join us. You are very welcome. Hello, my name is Mari Pangestu. I am the World Bank's Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnerships. COVID-19 conflict and climate change is expected to lead to hundreds and millions more people to enter into extreme poverty. Out of this, refugees will bear a disproportionate burden of this triple crisis. And already more than 79.5 million people, or slightly over 1% of humanity, have been displaced from their homes by the end of 2019. The World Bank is fully committed to addressing the causes for forced displacement and improving the lives of those affected. But we know we cannot do this alone. That is why we are partnering with the International Chamber of Commerce, the European Investment Bank, the UN Refugee Agency, and the Confederation of Danish Industry to create economic opportunities for refugees and their host communities. We're looking forward to hearing your ideas and working together with you towards this important goal and towards a better life for refugees. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, I think that we were very um, fortunate to have uh, the, the support of the leadership of um, the World Bank and ICC, uh, who've clearly expressed how important the role of the business community is in supporting the refugees. I would like you now to uh, introduce uh, Sasha Kabadia for our first um, 
panel on products and services. Uh, by products and services, we mean several things. It's about how large and small businesses adapt to serving the refugee community through market-driven approaches. It's about how businesses can complement public aid and about potentially changing its own business model. So Sasha will Kapadia, who's Director of Humanitarian and Development for MasterCard, where she works with humanitarian and development agencies to mobilize MasterCard solutions and expertise for good, will help us better understand how companies are working in this area. Sasha also leads the Smart Communities Coalition, a public-private effort to transform the delivery of essential services in refugee camps and settlements. So Sasha, MasterCard has been working on financial inclusion for a long time. Can you share with us how this work translates when working in the context of refugee communities? Thank you, Daphne, and thank you to the ICC and World Bank and teams for having me today. Um, as Daphne said, I represent MasterCard's humanitarian and development team. Uh, and for the better part of a decade, uh, MasterCard has worked quite diligently to uh, deploy its products, its services, its expertise, its experience uh, in the humanitarian and development context. And uh, obviously the, the needs of refugees are unique in many, many ways. Um, you know, many are fleeing uh, with, with very little and often uh, you know, do not have access to um, formal documentation or, or other sorts of materials that would allow them to um, start anew in, in a way that many of us do when we pick up and travel uh, all across the world. Um, but refugees and forcibly displaced also have many needs that are quite similar to underserved populations around the world. And so the mandate of my team is is really to bring innovation, um, to take on a shared value approach to um, product development and business models and apply them in these difficult to work in, in circumstances. Um, so the, the work that we initially started doing with refugees um, really was quite simple. So um, many who work in the humanitarian space know that cash assistance is a lifeline. Um, instead of providing goods or in-kind items, um, you know, re refugees or forcibly displaced can get uh, a mobile money transfer or a debit card or a prepaid card or even cash in an envelope that allows them to then go uh, and purchase the goods that they deem most appropriate for them and their families. Um, you know, in, in a world where everything is becoming increasingly electronic and, and, and digital, uh, it made sense for those cash transfers to migrate to electronic and digital means. Uh, and that's where a company like MasterCard um, found a very natural role to engage in, in the humanitarian and development sector. So whether it's in uh, Lebanon and Jordan or Kenya or Rwanda or Greece, you know, MasterCard products have been the tools used to distribute that really essential cash assistance uh, in, in, these, in these circumstances. Um, but that's not all. I think MasterCard sees the, you know, the role of providing essential services or enabling that access to essential services um, as, as key uh, above and, and beyond. And in this period of COVID-19, it, uh, it becomes all the more critical to migrate infrastructure that's been primarily um, high touch, right, where we've had uh, international staff flying into the field and assisting with operations or um, having lots of, of staff go and um, do, do trainings, um, you know, to, to pass out goods or, or to enable the the, the delivery, delivery of assistance, all of that has been transformed almost overnight and it makes digital infrastructure that much more uh, essential. And so that's the work that, that we're doing at, at MasterCard. And we believe that creating those digital rails, creating those digital networks that are open and allow for more companies to crowd in and, and utilize the infrastructure such that we can then um, have more visibility into needs. We can understand the demands of the communities that we wish to serve. Uh, and that then informs the way that we do serve, right? It allows for more companies like MasterCard uh, to take their core strengths, to take their core competencies and apply them in contexts where maybe they didn't think that they, they could do so before. And as we think about um, what
what happens now, I think a, a company like MasterCard, uh, and I know my my counterpart at at the Ten Partnership for Refugees is is on the the call on the presentation as well. You know, there are many many companies who have made lots of commitments, very public commitments to. Uh, to the forcibly displaced and their host communities. And those commitments are, are going to be adhered to and acted upon. But I do think that this is a moment now for us to reflect and understand how can we engage in a way that, that feels more meaningful, that feels more genuine to a company's DNA um, so that it's sustainable over the long term and that we're actually developing durable solutions. Stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, oops. Thank you very much, Sasha. I mean, that was really, uh, really interesting and very impressive to see how committed MasterCard is towards working towards more inclusive access to finance and especially um, the refugee community. And also how you're trying to adapt to the new situation, which I think has really not been easy for, for anybody, but making the services all that much more useful. <laughs> Yeah, and I think your, your the MasterCard story is a really a great example of how the uh, principles uh, in the Charter of Good Practice that Ben uh, to uh, is actually applying on the ground, you know. And I think you helped actually develop this charter, so um, you, you had a lot of input into it. For instance, uh, the principle of adaptive adaptation, how you adapt to you know the, the sort of specificities of the refugee context. Um, the concept of uh, sustainability and accountability, which I'd like to get back to, um, especially commercial viability and also, uh, you know, the importance of uh, partnerships. You talk about tent, you know, and I think that that's a very good partnership between a lot of co companies very committed on this front. Um, so, so concerning how you adapt, um, you know, MasterCard is clearly working very hard to listen to refugee needs, to make sure that services that you provide are actually adapted to their specific situation. How do you work with partners on the ground uh, to ensure this? Oh, it's absolutely critical, right? I think MasterCard um, can't do any of this work on its own, right? I think... Uh, I'm I'm sitting in Paris and I have very little insight. Well, I can I can read the news and I can read reports and I can do all sorts of, um, you know, all of these tasks to get myself informed and to inform colleagues and all, all of us can all of us do that work because we have to, but it's nothing like like having that footprint on the ground, and so working with partners I think helps. Uh, to shed light onto onto the needs and helps us get a real sense of the the journey, the experience um, that uh, a forcibly displaced person might have. Um, what's their day to day like, right? For for a product to be ultimately meaningful and for us to want to invest in it and continue to invest in it, it has to have usage. And so you'll never get the usage if that product is not designed in such a way that it actually reflects the, the needs and the demands of the community. Okay, and I guess one question which maybe companies with less experience and MasterCard going to the space might have is, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that it's sustainable uh, financially, for instance, and, you know, also how does it fit into the overall purpose and business strategy of the company? Uh, can you share with us how MasterCard approaches this? Sure. So, uh, so I said in, in my remarks that MasterCard um, and my team specifically takes on a shared value uh, approach. So, shared value believes that we're we're investing, um, we're we're developing products and, and services that we believe you know are assets and actually improve the way operations are conducted on the ground. And those organizations with whom we partner, they. Uh, you know, see the value in in those solutions and in those um, in those services that we're offering, but it requires a, quite a lot of thought into how you structure the business model so that it is viable over the long term. You know, a company like Mastercard, um, we're very fortunate that we're not necessarily. Um, you know, engaged in this work for those those short term quarterly gains, but rather we see this work as a long term investment into communities and, and countries where we might not have traditional products um, or traditional partners, our financial institution partners um, working with us. Right. So by developing a suite of solutions that are targeted 
at a, at a population that we currently don't serve, um, it gives us tremendous insight into needs and allows us to develop that relevance um, in those communities for the long term. So there's a, it's a very much a, a strategic endeavor, um, one that's tied to long term growth. Okay, well, thanks very much, Sasha. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience who will choose after the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then uh, we're going to move into the next session, which is on entrepreneurship. Uh, as we've heard very often, entrepreneurship is very often the only way forward for refugees arriving in a new country if we find difficulties in getting employment and other ways to earn a living. So in this session, we have three speakers. Uh, we will start off with um, Mutatutsi Tangi, who is a Burundian entrepreneur who fled to Rwanda as a refugee and used his entrepreneurial skills to rebuild a business in Rwanda. So Tangi is a great example of entrepreneurial success, working in his host country and adapting to the challenges incurred by COVID-19. Tangi is joined by his colleagues from the African Entrepreneur Collective in Komoko. Uh, so with him are Edison Mwinadata, who's a loan officer for Rwanda, and Olive Ashimwe, who's a regional refugee director for Rwanda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So in Komoko, and especially Edison Olive, have been key in supporting Tangi's success in Rwanda. And Tangi, I think we really look forward to listening to your story. Thank you very much. Tongi, you'll have to turn on your, can you turn on your microphone, please? Sorry. Next, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Tangi Mutatuz, and uh, I'm a Burundian refugee entrepreneur. I fled in Rwanda in 2015, and before doing so, I ran a bar and a restaurant in Burundi. Next. Once arrived in Rwanda, I registered a bar and restaurant in Rwanda Development Board with uh, a thousand dollars in cash. Over time, I was able to employ uh, 23 uh, permanent staff and two casual staff. 80% of them was, were refugees. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, we would save up to 500 uh, customers. My experience in Rwanda is that <clears throat> the host country has made has made it easier for me to work as a refugee entrepreneur because of its selenious policies uh, on doing business, entrepreneurship, technology, and infrastructure. Next. I was also lucky uh, that once I arrived in Rwanda, I had the opportunity to go through a one-year business development training at the African Entrepreneur Collective, locally known as Ingomoko. I came into contact with Ingomoko by seeing a flyer they distributed uh, through UNHCR. By connecting with them, I received support from a business consultant for almost two years, and I received two loans of uh, three thousand and eight thousand dollars. Next, my business has unfortunately suffered due to COVID nineteen, particularly because it's. It is in the hospitality sector. Due to the 
uh, curfew restrictions are forced. I lost about 60% of my clients and unfortunately had to lay off 50% of my employees. However, I decided not to quit my business, but instead to pivot to, pivot, uh, to home delivery services. A new grant uh, from Incomoco allowed me to purchase motorcycles and other assets for home delivery services. Next. Finally, let me uh, discuss how global initiatives such as PS4R can help religious entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. Uh, given my uh, given my experience, I would suggest that the partners in the PS4R initiative support intermediaries like Incomoco by uh, supporting low interest loans such as those uh, backed by Kiva, finding investors to work with refugees in the value chain, helping to ensure collateral for loans. More directly, the partners in the PS for our can support entrepreneurs by viewing refugees as eco contributors and not as renewable groups. Promote the global institutions such as CRRF to give them the right to work and help them gain collateral for loans to support their business and expansion. I'd like that the organization for inv inviting me to present my story and I look forward to connect you with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tong Ying. That was really a very... Uh, Thank you. To have your story firsthand. I really appreciate it sharing that with us. Um, I think it really shows that with uh, the help of your colleagues from Inkomoku, um, you know, that it's really, it's possible for entrepreneurs with the right kind of policies in the country with help with financing capacity building that um, and the right support that you can really make it success. And we really hope that uh, you'll be able to recover from the crisis. Uh, if uh, we'll now move to the next, um, um, to Tanya Dedovich, who's a senior regional thematic specialist from IOM, the International Organization of Migra Migration. Uh, Tanya is based in Cairo and she oversees uh, IOM work on mobility and human development in 17 countries of the MENA region and has over 20 years of experience, which we're very happy for you to share with us in making comments uh, on Tongi's presentation and also in sharing some words on IOM's recent work with other key partners and hopefully also to give us some ideas on how PS4R can be useful in helping them move forward. Please go ahead, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daphne. Thank you also to the organizers, the, the members of the private sector for refugees platform to also give us um, the floor um, to basically um, respond on the one hand to the presentation from Tangui, which uh, actually really nicely illustrates uh, the whole rationale of uh, the project that um, that IOM has been developing in partnership with Impact Hub um, on entrepreneurship for migrants and refugees. So um, being uh, the representative of IOM, I will be so free to also um, include uh, the migrants in, in this whole discourse that we are having here today. Um, I think what really came out nicely from Tangui's presentation is that we should see refugees and migrants as uh, let's let's call them eco contributors, not just as vulnerable uh, groups uh, or populations that need to be served and need to be uh, taken care of. Yeah? I think uh, what he really brought out nicely is uh, this agency that we can expect from migrants and refugees as long as we also provide the framework so that they can actually start developing their ideas and their potential. So, um, and 
I think he, the other point that he, he made is that he, uh, when he was talking about how the platform, uh, the private sector for refugees platform could promote and support the work, um, he was mentioning basically the work uh, of, uh, that is being done by UNHCR under the Global Compact for Refugees. And I think, um, Daphne, you were asking how the private sector for refugees platform can support uh, this initiative. Um, I think uh, one one way would be simply for for this platform to to extend this. Um, whole concept of uh, and this good charter, the charter of good practice, also to the work uh, on that we are doing actually together with UNHCR also on migrants. In fact, uh, we have developed with uh, UNCTAD and UNHCR a policy guide for entre entrepreneurship among migrants and refugees. And that policy guide picks up a lot of the recommendations, the points that, uh, that uh, the private sector uh, for refugees platform has uh, come up with in this charter for good practice. And because Benjamin was uh, saying in the very beginning that, uh, for example, this event here is uh, also about talking how this knowledge can be transformed into operations. I would like to maybe um, just briefly um, to describe the kind of uh, the project that we have developed with Impact Hub and how we see that these principles and recommendations could be put into practice. Um, the project goes a bit further than what uh, Tangui was uh, describing in his story, in the sense that uh, it does not only work with the migrants or the refugees themselves, but it also works with the governments. It works with the governments on creating the kind of legal frameworks and regulations that migrants or refugees need in order to formalize their businesses to access these low interest loans that Tangui was mentioning that are necessary for them to start up or expand their businesses. The project also works with private sector, so governments and private sector on the whole value chain development, on impact investment, on procurement, so that uh, the private sector can really effectively support um, a number of migrant and refugee entrepreneurs and, and help them to scale up their businesses also. Um, the project also works with the service providers, such as Incomoco, um, because Impact Hub has already a global network of such, uh, let's say, incubators. But um, the idea is that uh, Impact Hub with this project would reach out also to other service providers and, um, and provide additional training and support for migrants and refugees at all the different stages of their entrepreneurship journey. And, uh, and basically also reach out to the service providers to increase the networking between them and to create these uh, communities of impact. This is how we called it. And uh, finally, the project wants to bring out the top entrepreneurs. So this uh, project, which is um, a global project um, because we have five pilot countries around the globe. Um, this project will also want to bring out the top entrepreneurs from each of those five countries and bring them together in an annual global award to highlight the stories of successful entrepreneurs such as Tangui, for example. And with this additional element of uh, basically highlighting the success stories of these migrant and refugee entrepreneurs, um, we as IOM, together with Impact Hub, we really also want to contribute to change this whole narrative uh, around migration, migrants, refugees, you know, from being a burden to societies to the positive contribution they can make to their host societies as entrepreneurs if they are given the chance to do so. And in that sense, um, again, I really want to thank uh, all the colleagues with who I have been in touch in discussing this uh, Charter of Good Practice and uh, the colleagues who have been organizing this event uh, for having me and giving me the opportunity to shed a little bit of light also on the work that uh, we are doing 
uh, in partnership with uh, some of the organizations that are present and that are members of this platform on migrants as well as refugees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya, for sharing those initiatives and for your, your recommendations for PS4R. As, and also thank you, Tongyi, for your ideas as well. Um, so uh, just to remind everybody that if there will be a question answer session after the next panelist. So please do fill in, um, uh, put your questions on the Q&A and we'll gather them to ask our distinguished panelists later on. Um, now we'll go on to our third speaker. Uh, she's our final speaker for this session on entrepreneurship. She's Maria Monica Conde Baragan, who's the Vice President of International Affairs and Cooperation at the Bogota Chamber of Commerce. She's also Secretary General of ICC's Office in Colombia, IC, uh, ICC Colombia. So Maria Monica has a long experience at the Bogota Chamber, which is a very dynamic uh, part of the IC network and on issues of entrepreneurship and international trade. Um, the Bogota Chamber, as I said, is extremely dynamic uh, and uh, early on during the Venezuelan refugee crisis started taking action to see how the business community could contribute to integrating uh, Venezuelan refugees uh, into the economy. So Maria Monica uh, will explain the program and how it has been affected by COVID-19. So um, over to you, Maria Monica. Good day for everyone. And thank you so much to all members of the Private Sector for Ref Refugees Initiative for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to talk about the actions that the Chamber of Commerce of Bogota is working on regarding the migration situation of people from Venezuela and how we have worked to promote economic reactivation. Next. Thank you. Next. Next, please. Thank you. Um, these are the main topics we are going to discuss today. Next, please. First, I would like to uh, tell you about our actions regarding the Venezuelan population's migratory situation in our country. The BCC, the Bogota Chamber, believes that the migration of Venezuelans and Colombian returnees is an opportunity for the local economy's growth due to the transfer of know-how to increase quality, efficiency, and companies' productivity. It's important to recognize that Colombia is one of the border countries with Venezuela and is receiving country for migrant migratory flows. For that reason, we developed a pilot project to strengthen this population's capacities. The, the Bogota Chamber tested the pilot in Bogota between August and December 2019. Also, the Productive Migration is a program that provides support to Venezuelan migrants and Colombian returnees with a specialized mentoring, a strengthening of contact networks and individual support with business experts. This is an intensive program and it lasts four months. The program looks for participants with an entrepreneurial mindset, creative, dynamic, innovative ideas or products and want to grow and enter into the Colombian market. Next, please. Now, I want to tell you that we had more than 100 interviews that allowed us to select the 30 entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs and 30 businesses who would begin the training process. Likewise, the project favored the interaction and the generation of relation between the entrepreneurs and, and it showed that 15% of them managed to establish commercial alliance with other project entrepreneurs. 67% of the entrepreneurs and 69 of the companies increased their sales level. Regarding the financing on entrepreneurs, 33% are making arrangement to access bank credits. 30% 30 pl 30 plan to finance entrepreneurship with their own resources. Also, 22% don't have the requirement to access. Finally, 11% don't have planet financial sources or do not consider it necessary. 
19% of entre entrepreneurs decide to change their business model after receiving advice based on their skills and entrepreneurship impact in the, part, in the market. We also had other significant results, such as the ones you are seeing, and if someone is interested, we can share them in more detail. Also, I want to emphasize that 35% of the companies generate new formal jobs. Next, please. Finally, we believe that the lessons learned from the project are essential regarding the following aspect. We can tell you that the success to reach the program participants is based on the use of digital strategies in social networks to identify influencers that generate trust and explain the scope of chamber of of commerce to get them involved in the project. On the other hand, in the project's execution, we developed a large part of the activities in the evenings and on weekends, since it was the only time available for our participants. We included their families in training activities and we did homologation of concepts and technical terms. Next, please. Now I'm going to tell you how COVID-19 has charged our activities. It's a pretty interesting after dog because we have transformed ourselves to support small and medium companies from the VCC. Our Together Reactivating Business Activity Program provides individual support and monitoring to achieve broad scope and visible results by identifying entrepreneurs' needs and helping them implement solutions and measure results. In this slide, you can see how we create some routes, strategies, and activities so that the entrepreneur knew that he was not alone. We have visited more than 250 companies and we have served more than 320,000 people with our, with our different services in digital platforms. About the mentoring program in mega results, more than 1,200 companies have attended 700 of them in, this, in, the, in the last year. The average satisfaction throughout this year is 97% and 100% of them recommend us. Ne next, please. Finally, about the PS4R platform for the Bogota Chamber of Commerce, we agreed that promoting the economic integration of refugees into the host country contributes to increase social cohesion and national growth. This platform is an excellent opportunity to encourage refugees, entrepreneurship, and target products and services for them. I might like to tell you that since the launch of the platform, it has become an essential tool for our structuring of action for the benefit of the migrant population. From the Bogota Chamber of Commerce, we invite other organizations to connect and share their experience. Thank, thank you so much. So much. Oh, thank you very much, Mary Monica. I think that was, uh, it's very impressive what the Bogota Chamber is doing and the results it's achieved. Uh, and, um, but we're wondering, you know, with the impact of the COVID situation, what, what has, has that changed anything in your project? Thank you, Dadne, for your question. The current situation has been an opportunity to adapt our project to the migrant population needs. We are implementing the program at a faster pace and include a specialized digital marketing platform, B2B and B2C platforms. We, all, we have also prioritized the participation of women and we have joined activities with local and migrants. Okay. That's great. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And um, please stay on, um, Mary Monica, because we're going to now ask uh, the other panelists to, to come back on so that they can ask some questions. We have quite a few questions in the chat for them. Um, okay, Sasha, if I could start with you. We have a few questions for you. Um, one, for an SME looking to expand its target market, what would you say is attractive about the refugee population? Looking at market now. Yeah, so I actually saw a comment in the, the Q&A that I thought was really uh, quite perceptive. I think the, the, the idea or the, the misconception about refugees is that they are um, helpless and, and dependent on aid. And I think that is 
is very far from the truth. Um, so once you actually see these communities uh, and, and you're, you're in them, you know that there are lively marketplaces, there's quite a bit of entrepreneurial activity, uh, and there's a desire to, to live normal lives, right? I think the, the time of displacement, you know, people think of it, oh, people are displaced for a year or two years, but it's actually, you know, the average period of displacement is 15 years or so. So people are really, they're, they're having children, they're getting married, they're going to school. Um, so anything that you would want in your life is what a, a refugee wants. And so I think uh, there's a lot of good data now that's being produced about um, disposable income among forcibly displaced populations, willingness to pay, um, what they are spending their income on, um, and it's, it's all quite insightful. And I think in we need to have more of that data to help uh, inform decision-making uh, for service providers to help them better serve. I think, uh, so I would say more data uh, and, and more visibility into needs will allow for SMEs to, to serve the market more, more robustly. Super, thanks. Um, now for uh, Tanya, is Tanya back? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, okay, Tanya, we have a question for, for you. Uh, does your program make a difference between refugees and economic migrants? And if so, why? Um, the person who commented felt that the COVID-19 may have blurred a little bit the frontiers between migrants and refugees. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, as I as I mentioned briefly, uh, in particular in this project, uh, which we see very much as a response to COVID-19. Um, but actually, even going back to, to, to the policy guide that we have developed together with UNHCR and with UNCTAD, um, this is a policy guide on entrepreneurship for migrants and refugees. So no, we do not really distinguish between uh, refugees and migrants when we work with them on entrepreneurship and clearly also not in that uh, project, in this global project, which we hope to be able to launch um, in, in those five countries where we work in very different contexts from Mexico to Cambodia and from the Netherlands to Turkey, yeah, where you have very different populations. In some instances, we are targeting returning migrants. In other countries, in Netherlands, we are targeting diaspora entrepreneurs. In Mexico, we are talking about stranded migrants. So. Um, no, I wouldn't say that we are actually making a difference between refugees and migrants, and we do work together with UNHCR um, in basically targeting those two populations. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have a question for Tongi. Uh, Tongi, you mentioned an organization that supported you when you set up your business upon arrival. Um, so they're asking, I guess they're talking about Inokomo. Um, what type of services did they provide? Is the question. Thank you. Um, first, uh, one of them, uh, the first thing they did was uh, training. I got training for one year, for one year, three months. And um, after that, I got a consultant uh, for two years almost. And um, after that, I get loans, two, two loans. Uh, one was of, uh, three million, uh, almost three thousand dollars, and the second one was eight million, uh, almost uh, eight eight thousand US dollars. Yes. Okay. So great. Thank you very much. Um, then we have a question from Maria Monica. Why did the Chamber of Bogota decide uh, the Colombian to combine the Colombian uh, migrant returnees with the Venezuelan refugees in the same project? Daphne, both migrants and Colombian returnees have many financial needs. Unfortunately, these returnees return to life situation without financial conditions and quality of life. Thus, it's essential to provide options so that the Colombian people can once again move the country's economy. For that reason, 
we put together or we decide support both community in this project. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, you are great. I think there is, yeah, I think we have covered all the questions. I mean, I think that the, that was a great session. Well, thank you very much. It was very really interesting for everybody. And in response to, I think, a question that was on the, on the uh, Q&A, uh, the, this, these presentations, uh, well, this whole proceedings are being recorded, so you'll be able to access them and share them with anybody who wasn't able to attend today. So, well, just thank you very much again to our great speakers. Uh, it was really uh, a, a great panel. And um, we're going to have a really short break now uh, before uh, we come again. We'll be starting off after the break uh, with a, a short video message from Filippo Grandi, the High Commissioner for Refugees, who will be sharing some words of welcome from his side. Thank you all. Uh, you are coming back from the little break that we had. So uh, I hope you could uh, also think about all the interesting comments and intervention we just had. It's amazing how it takes a full array of actors to help uh, this issue of, of how the, the refugees can be empowered to uh, have the means to sustain themselves, to contribute to the uh, societies where, they, where they're arriving in and, and really uh, have a positive economic impact uh, on those countries and for themselves. We will uh, start this uh, new segment with a video of uh, the UNHCR High Commissioner, Filippo Grandi, who has agreed to give some remarks to the group. Today's uh, challenges, the pandemic, the climate emergency, poverty and inequality, conflict, and even forced displacement, which is often a consequence of the others, require collective and concrete efforts to respond and help those in need. While we at the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Organization, focus on the humanitarian response to save lives, as well as protection for the nearly 80 million refugees and other displaced people around the world, we need the help, advice, and expertise of the private sector if we are to respond to the needs. One way you can help is to do what you do best, create jobs. But see refugees also as entrepreneurs, producers of goods and services, and as members of your community. By giving refugees a chance, you can provide them with opportunities humanitarian aid cannot. You can help them integrate into the economy and society, boosting the self-reliance. While the private sector can also benefit from a great source of strength, resilience and inspiration. Refugees want nothing more than to provide for their families and be an active contributor to the societies that host them. Join us in confronting this challenge together. Thank you, and these are, these are great remarks, very inspiring. Um, you know, we, we have heard in the previous session uh, a lot of things about what it takes to for an entrepreneur to uh, make it as a refugee and also to adapt products and services for uh, refugees and we had a great talk from Sasha on this the we also you know we I, we got a question online uh, from our colleague uh, Peter Helk uh, from the Confederation of uh, Danish Industries which is a core partner in this PS4R initiative about the importance of uh, regulations and also the uh, the difficulty the political difficulty that those uh, regulation might bring from a government who wants to integrate refugees but also face issues such as uh, unemployment or, or other issues in its own country so we know this is difficult so we're going to try to see 
all that applies to a topic like employment, for instance, which is the next topic that we are going to cover. As you remember, the Charter of Good Practice is covering four topics, product and services and entrepreneurship, where the two one that we did in the first session. And now we're going to tackle the issues of employment and the issues of investment with um, uh, interventions by uh, Scarlett Cronin and uh, Shelley Smith in the, in the first uh, session, and then on investment by uh, Alfinas Murad and Khaled Kutob uh, in the second part on investment. But let's start right away with uh, employment. Um, we, uh, I'd like to bring in uh, on the stage uh, Scarlett Cronin, who is uh, the Senior Director of Private Sector Partnerships at the Tent Partnership for Refugees. And the Tent Partnership for Refugees has done an amazing job until now. We actually started at the World Bank working with them very early on through a round table in 2017, where a lot of those ideas about what can we do all together to promote the role of the private sector for the refugees came out, you know, uh, between the, the president of the World Bank at the time and the head of the Tom Foundation, um, Hamdi Ulukaya, we, we were uh, thinking about what can we do. And out of this, we started this, this knowledge and operation journey uh, in parallel and together. And so I'm very happy to, uh, to see uh, Scarlett um, today. Uh, she'll describe the, the, the TAN partnership, but also uh, she's speaking from the point of view of her experience, not only at the TAN partnership, but she worked before at the Clinton Global Initiative and at the Elie Wiesel Foundation. She's got a great outlook on how philanthropies can help uh, this work. Scarlett, over to you. Thank you so much, Benjamin, and thank you um, to all the organizers for, for having having me here today. It's, it's really a pleasure. And as Benjamin was just alluding to, we, we have spent lots of time together these past few years really trying to put our heads together around the issue of how to make sure that refugees can be integrated into their new communities. And um, it's, been, it's been really a pleasure to work with the, with the World Bank on this now for several years. And um, yeah, I'd love to begin just by sharing a little bit of background on, on TENT. Um, just to situate everybody with our work, and then we'll really dive into the issue of employment. And um, as, as Benjamin mentioned, we were founded by Hamdi Ulukaya. He himself is the CEO of, um, of a major U.S. food company called Shabani, a yogurt company. And he has hired refugees for years here in the United States and saw firsthand just the incredible motivation and loyalty and work ethic that refugees brought to his company and really considered refugees to be a major um, you know, ingredient for his success. And he wanted to use his position as CEO to mobilize other businesses to step up in support of refugees. So he started Tent with the ambition of, of getting other companies on board um, and supporting refugees in ways that they could. So the Tent Partnership, in essence, is, is a network of more than 130 companies. Uh, Sasha um, from, from MasterCard mentioned earlier, uh, MasterCard is a member, as well as companies like Unilever, Philips, Accenture, Airbnb, H&M, it, it, it's a broad range and, and really the unifying um, factor for all these companies is that they are doing something in support of refugees globally. And we really encourage companies to move beyond philanthropy, which is, of course, very much the conversation that we're all having here today. And one of our key focus areas is, is employment. So we work with companies um, and really pitch companies on this issue of hiring refugees, helping them figure out based on where they have operations, based on where they have business needs, um, the kind of best way forward for them to be able to, to bring refugees into their workforce, whether that's directly uh, or indirectly through, through their supply chain. And, and just to mention a couple of examples um, of, uh, within the tent membership of, of companies that are employing refugees. Accenture in the Netherlands um, is, is hiring 100 refugees over the next several years for a variety of positions within their company. Teleperformance, the French um, uh, BPO and call service company, uh, has stepped up to hire more than 1,000 Venezuelan refugees in Colombia. And I think really interestingly in that example, um, Teleperformance has found that the Venezuelan refugees that work for them have a turnover rate of only 1% per 
which is incredibly striking when we look at the average turnover rate uh, within the call center industry, which is around 40%. So teleperformance is seeing huge business benefits to hiring refugees um, and, and bringing them into their workforce, um, which has um, been, I think, just very, very telling and, and really important for, for the work that we do in trying to convince other companies to step up as well. Um, and as has already been mentioned by you know, many of the other speakers and, of course, coming after the High Commissioner of UNHCR, it is so key that the private sector makes sure that it's finding ways to help refugees to integrate economically into their new communities and find ways to be productive members of society. Now, having said all of that, of course, we, we find ourselves uh, find all of ourselves right now in very uh, you know challenging circumstances and in un unusual times when it comes to the context um, that we're working in and, and, and as a result of COVID-19. So I just wanted to share a few of the challenges that, that we're currently seeing in the work that we do with businesses around employment specifically. Uh, so the first, and this is probably the most obvious, is that there is relatively high, too high unemployment around the world in refugee hosting countries. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about countries in the US and Europe, um, as well as um, countries um, in you know, the Middle East and Africa. But, but COVID-19 has certainly just had a massive impact in terms of, um, in, in terms of um, local economies, um, as, as we're all dealing with varying um, kind of um, you know, ranges of, of, of recessions. And we expect that um, this will persist, the high unemployment rates will persist as long as COVID exists, and then potentially for several months longer um, as, as economies sort of um, bounce back and come back. So that's, you know, a huge, a huge challenge for us right now when it comes to hiring is uh, asking companies to think about bringing, uh, you know, new, um, um, expanding their workforce at a time when they're dealing with furloughs and layoffs. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not the kind of right thing to be talking to companies about at the moment, although we do expect that to change. Um, and then a second challenge that we see is unfortunately rising xenophobia in some countries towards refugees. So one example is Colombia, uh, where support for uh, Venezuelans' ability to work and, and really um, for Colombians to be supportive of, of Venezuelans um, being able to work has dropped from 58% to 43%. So that also creates a challenge for businesses that might be thinking about hiring refugees, um, even in this period if they are, what it might look like um, um, sort of optically or the backlash that they might get within their communities if they're seen to be hiring refugees over other other groups um, and perhaps you know local nationals Colombians in this case so that that's something that we're also um, grappling with and, and dealing with um, and then the third challenge that we see is that refugees serving nonprofits um, around the world which play such an important role in helping uh, to train refugees to get them ready for um, you know for the workforce provide different types of support they're under acute financial stress um, and as they're no longer seeing the donations or financial support that they um, that they have over the past few years, so so that's that's definitely a real uh, challenge as well. And then um, just to just to provide a bit more context in terms of. Um, the economic impact um, on the lives of refugees as a result of COVID, um, it has been it has been quite devastating. So just just to cite a few examples, in Turkey, two out of three refugees have lost their jobs. Uh, here in the United States, it's it's that same stat. Two out of three uh, recently resettled refugees in the U.S. have have lost their sources of income. So um, it is it is quite stark. Um, Having said all that, there is still really key ways that we have seen businesses adapt to, to the climate that we're in, to the context that we're in, um, to be able to continue su to support refugees. Um, and so just, just to name a couple of these, um, we, you know, we we have found that uh, a number of member companies in the Tent Partnership have have found creative ways to support refugees at this time. So one example is um, is Philips, and Philips is hiring refugees in, in the Netherlands and Germany, and, and that's something that they're continuing to do. But they wanted to try to find another way to support refugees at this moment. So they invested in a social enter enterprise run by refugees in the Netherlands. Um, and and the, um, the social enterprise was manufacturing face masks um, and then 
uh, Phillips became one of their biggest purchasers. So, so finding other ways to support refugees and make sure that they have uh, access to income. Uh, and then we're also seeing a lot of opportunities at the moment and, and ways that companies are supporting refugees around training um, and around mentorship, um, mentorship um, initiatives so that down the road, refugees will have um, you know, more, um, more skills, uh, a better network in terms of finding access to jobs. So I think it's really just about companies at this moment while they're while they're you know struggling to, to certain degrees, finding other ways to still provide uh, these types of support to refugees so that they will be in a better position um, down the road to find jobs. Um, and just one example there is that um, here in the in the US, but also in Canada and Mexico, we've been working um, with um, uh, two dozen companies um, who are engaging their employees to support uh, LGBTQ refugees, uh, which are a group that are acutely vulnerable. Um, once they arrive in, in new communities, they often do not have good access to support for finding jobs and, and how to kind of get back on their feet when it comes to livelihood. So companies um, from Bain, uh, to Accenture, um, to TD Bank, will be stepping up um, at a public event we're doing in a few weeks to, to show their support for mentoring LGBTQ refugees in order to help them uh, be in a better position to find jobs down the, down the road. And that's an initiative that we'll look uh, to replicate in other contexts as well, seeing a lot of interest from companies to, to support in that way. So I think the, you know, the good news is that there, there still are um, a lot of ways that companies are, are showcasing their support, helping refugees find access to employment, um, but it looks quite different just being completely honest, it looks quite different now than it did a year ago when we were having, uh, you know, several dozen conversations with companies about pretty sizable commitments and, and efforts to hire refugees. So I think we're all just uh, waiting for, for the next period um, and expect that companies will step up again uh, in, in that way around employment. Um, right. And then the last thing, just to say, Benjamin, I think you're, you're, you're coming in just to say in, in terms of how uh, PS4R could be relevant, um, uh, to companies seeking to employ refugees. I think there's a huge, huge amount that um, that the group can do around the regulatory environment and making sure that there are policies that work for businesses uh, who are trying to hire refugees and, and to make that process very clear. So I think that's something that we'd love to see, see more work around. Thank you, Scarlett. I'm trying to stop my video again. Here we go. Well, thank you very much, Scarlett. And it's really an amazing work that you've done at the Tent Foundation, at the Tent Partnership for Refugees, sorry. And uh, not only in terms of gathering the, the people around the table and promoting this idea, but also um, about the research that you have sponsored and the data that, that you have cited comes from some of that research. But I'm more amazed beyond what you've done at the energy that um, really foresighted people in the private sector have and keep having despite the very difficult circumstances of the COVID-19 crisis to keep pushing for this agenda. And I think it's, it's, it's something that goes beyond um, like, um, you know, when, when companies adopt social or environmental standards or things like this. When it comes to the issues of refugees, there is something essentially humane about this issue that, that drives people to do it. And we also have to remember that a lot of people in the private sector have struggled themselves and moved from countries to countries and can relate to those issues. And they recognize that, that refugees are also very much an asset for their companies. And it's not just a do-gooding thing, it's really an asset and there is a huge business case for it. We, we got inspired ourselves by the work that you've done by working in Jordan, for instance, and managed by doing some business to business matchmaking between companies abroad and companies in Jordan to create real employment. So this is something that works and that can be spread. It would be very interested to, to hear the UNHCR take on all this. And I'd like to, uh, to invite next Celine Schmidt from the UNHCR in France uh, to comment uh, and and to provide uh, a thought about uh, about their own work. Uh, Céline is a senior external relations officer and spokesperson for UNFCR in France. Her role is to engage uh, and develop partnerships to create a positive environment for refugees arriving in Europe and to ensure that uh, the 
refugees can really participate in, in the decisions impacting their own life. She's been with UNHCR since 2007. She's been working also uh, in a Great Lakes region. So she's got experience not only in Europe, but uh, also in Africa. So let's hear the perspective of, of the UN Refugee Agency when it comes to all this. You know that, you know, the UN Refugee Agency is very much is uh, people think about it as a humanitarian agency, right? The refugees arrive and you're going to come and, and try to save the day. But you're not thinking about what are the next steps on the development, on bringing the private sector side. So over to you, Celine, and tell us a little bit about all that work, please. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, and I'm very happy to participate in the event uh, today. And yes, as you said, UNHCR is uh, known as um, a humanitarian organization, but as part of our mandate, uh, we do as well uh, search uh, for durable solutions for refugees, and uh, that's a very important part uh, of our work. Um, even more in today's context. So the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has uh, dramatically impacted the almost 80 million people who are displaced uh, worldwide. It's a health crisis, but not only. It's also for them a socio-economic crisis. Uh, it's a new crisis on top of already existing challenges. Um, and as you, you may have seen, conflicts, violence have not stopped. Uh, because of the virus. People continue to flee. Um, our work is, is to respond to emergencies, to support refugees, to work with refugees and to work with partners to find solutions for them, but also for their hosts. And therefore, when there is an emergency, we stay and we deliver it. Uh, this is also what we did during this emergency, this pandemic. Uh, but this time, uh, it's a challenge. It has been a challenge, unlike any other, because all our offices worldwide had to be uh, invested, has had to be responding uh, to the situation. Uh, but our staff stayed. They delivered, trying to find solutions. Um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees have called us because uh, they've lost their jobs uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and of course, um, we need you and we need to work with partners to, to find uh, solutions for those uh, challenges. Uh, so what did we do uh, on our side to adapt to the COVID-19, to, to the pandemic? Uh, first of all, uh, we reinforced uh, also our humanitarian assistance. Uh, we reinforced our water, sanitation, health responses, uh, including mental health, uh, we, which was crucial um, in, in a crisis. Um, we also uh, stepped up our support for refugee education uh, because there too, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was a new challenge uh, for access to refugee education. Uh, and we worked with different partners to make sure uh, refugee children can continue to have access to education, uh, also uh, via uh, distance learning um, and digital inclusion, uh, we, which is very important in a time um, of pandemic. We also strengthened our response in terms of shelter, uh, cash grants, as I said, um, many refugees called us asking for direct financial support, including the most vulnerable refugees who really rely on cash grants to be able uh, to meet uh, their daily needs. Uh, we worked with refugees, with the communities to share the right information, to share the right information to prevent the spread of the pandemic, um, but also to combat stigma, uh, discrimination, um, and Scarlett mentioned also that, that challenge. And, and this is also uh, an important part of our work to work together with refugees to share uh, the right information because sharing the right information can also help to, to save lives. Uh, so how are we working with the private sector and um, how can PS4R uh, support our work? Um, there are two points I, I would like to suggest and, and to raise. Uh, first of all, uh, the private sector can support our work and, and can support the work to find solutions for refugees in helping to connect refugees with the labor market uh, and facilitating their access to, to job. This is very important. And even more now, um, worldwide, refugees have lost their jobs including in France, uh, we, we have a working group with, with refugees. Uh, we're working with them 
to, to find solutions um, to the current situation. And the main challenge they've mentioned to us during uh, the, our sessions is uh, access to job. Uh, some have lost their jobs, some are worried they won't be able to find a job anymore. So working together uh, for that, um, to that purpose is very important. Secondly, um, the work with the private sector is also very important to raise awareness about the potential of refugees. And other speakers today have mentioned that. Um, but it's very important to, to raise awareness about the role that refugees can play. Um, th they can play together with their host communities. We've seen uh, again during the pandemic that refugees have been uh, on the front line to respond to COVID uh, together with their hosts. Uh, again, in France also, many refugees have called us and said, we would like to support we are doctors, uh, we are tailors, we can make masks. How can we support the response to the COVID? Because we would like to show uh, solidarity with our hosts. Uh, we would like to protect them as they have protected us when we fled our country. Um, and for that, partnering together with you is very important to, to be sure to raise awareness um, about that, uh, awareness about the de dedication of refugees, but also their courage. And finally, um, I think our partnership and working together with the private sector is also very important uh, to support our humanitarian response, um, to, to work together with us to improve connectivity for refugees, for example, uh, to find innovative ways to provide vital help. Uh, I mentioned refugee education. Uh, which is very important, but also to find durable solutions, including in terms of uh, legal pathways. So these are the few points I wanted to mention in my short time. I hope it was not too quick, um, but I'm happy to reply to questions as well. Thank you uh, very much, Celine. And it's, uh, it is a struggle. I say uh, I sit on the ground in many countries uh, I work in, uh, working with the UNHCR in the context of, of uh, acute refugee crisis of how to try to uh, help the refugees find jobs because at the end of the day you know this is one of the key way they're going to they're going to be able to to remain there to integrate or even if they want to return you know they're going to have uh, as someone that said earlier um, you know when refugees arrive it's it's for a long while often you know it's much longer than what we think it's going to be at the beginning and so finding jobs you know is 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 a difficult thing and it needs to have different type of interventions. You need to have uh, supply side interventions where we build the skills of the refugees and try to have different kind of vocational training or different kind of programs or integrate them into the education system, which requires uh, some regulatory work that was called for by the previous speaker by, by Scarlett. And so once you have all that is great, but when you have a COVID-19 crisis, that hits the country on top of it, it's very difficult because there is less and less jobs, right? Everybody's losing their jobs. So we have to work on both. But even when there is no crisis, you need those two kinds of intervention, the supply side type of intervention, but also the demand side of intervention, which means creating demand in the market for jobs, meaning that the companies that are in the country need to be strong enough to be able to want to attract new people. And for those companies to grow, it's very essential that they access capital. And this capital and those investment that they can benefit from is often in fragile environments because where you have a very massive influx of refugees, it creates sometimes a fragile environment and companies need to be able to access capital that are sometimes willing to have a little bit more risk than regular money. And so how do you do this? And this is how what we're gonna discuss in our next section on investment with Alfinas Murad and Khaled Kutob. Alfinas Murad is our, is our first uh, speaker and uh, she's from uh, Grofin. Uh, she's the investment executive from Grofin Jordan and Grofin helps SMEs grow by providing them with uh, financing and value-added business support. And in Jordan, they, they're working with refugees, but not only about uh, with refugees also among with other populations in, in Jordan, including the host communities, which are extremely important, of course, that need also to grow and be strong economically to be able to, to uh, welcome refugees. 
Uh, Alfina is, is very experienced in those kind of financing world. She's got more than 15 years of experience in investment banking and finance. And uh, she worked also at the United Nations Population Fund, the UNFPA, and Jordan Invest, where uh, she was VP, COO, CFO, and, and everything in between. So Alfina, you're very experienced and you, you are in a market which is extremely difficult because the Jordanian market has uh, companies that are presenting investable opportunities, but not that many of them. And so how do you bring new money into the market that can really help invest into those companies so that they can create growth, jobs, opportunities for refugees and host communities together? Over to you. I believe you are muted, Alfinaz. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Benjamin, for having me today. And uh, let me start by introducing Grofen uh, for the starters. Grofen is a global fund manager specialized uh, in lending non-banking SMEs. Um, in Jordan, we manage the Numu Jordan Fund. And the main mandate of, of that fund is to finance and help entrepreneurs and SMEs to grow and sustain in, a, in order to create new jobs through our unique business support uh, approach. Um, uh, you will find our link on the screen during the Q&A if you are interested to know more about growth and, and, and the fund. Uh, SMEs and non-Jordanian entrepreneurs, the missing middle uh, face challenges in Jordan, such as access to finance due to local regulations by the central bank or uh, the policies uh, of the commercial banks. Um, this segment represents around 90% of Jordan's private sector and around half of its uh, GDP. Uh, uh, NUMU Fund was established in 2014 and managed to disburse $24 million to 42 non-bankable SMEs. And our shareholders, among others, are the KFW, the Open Society Foundation, Shell Foundation, DGGF, and Lindin Foundation. So during the Syrian uh, war and the influx of um, Syrians to Jordan, we found quite interesting Syrian entrepreneurs could not access finance as they are not Jordanians and without uh, sufficient collateral. So. Uh, uh, we started financing uh, uh, those talented Syrians. Today, we have managed to finance 10 refugees and migrants. Six of those are Syrians. And also the fund is sustaining now 1,634 jobs and 182 of which are for refugees and migrants. Uh, I would like to share a story of a Syrian refugee client that we have in our portfolio. Uh, his name is Abu Arab Haidar. Sit Sham is their commercial name. They produce unique, uh, authentic Syrian and uh, Arabic food and sweets. Uh, this entrepreneur has been operating in Syria since 1956, but the Syrian war forced him to relocate to his business to Jordan. Um, the company opened in Amman uh, and he used his own resources to uh, uh, opened this, uh, this, this place. And after a while, he faced um, a, a cash flow bottleneck trying to expand and make the business sustainable. However, he could not obtain, of course, any loan from banks. Um, just to add a little bit more information, foreigners are subjected to certain restrictions owning properties in Jordan, and therefore they cannot have, have be having collateral for, for banks. So Numu Fund financed this business uh, and purchased stocks and uh, uh, to meet their growing demand. And this funding also enabled them to open another branch and lower their costs, uh, attaining uh, cash discounts on, on bulks to import. What we did is the following. We, um, uh, we designed a marketing plan and improved their digital presence and channels and increased their revenues to reach exporting some of their products. We improved governance and ESG where they became compliant. We tied the business with, with supply chains and strengthened uh, uh, sustainability in revenues. And uh, during the COVID, we supported the business during the lockdown period 
by stress testing their cash flows and helped uh, absorbing the decline in sales resulted from the pandemic without severe damage. We also supported them with a concession of several payments, seizing payments and interest. Actually, the fund subsidized the uh, interests. And currently, uh, we are thinking of, um, uh, we are linking them with uh, uh, the ESCAPE 19 project. Um, uh, therefore, the impact of NUMO uh, fund was grow the business, employ 90 people, uh, for 48 of which are Syrian refugees and managed to create 20 additional jobs. COVID-19 imposed serious challenges on, on all businesses except for a few sectors. Be it from closing borders, lockdowns, reduced uh, demand, yet the Syrian suffered most uh, as Jordan is under the defense law which bans companies firing Jordanians. So companies were forced helplessly to fire the Syrians and we could see that clearly in our portfolio where most of the job lost is among Syrians. Our needs to continue our work Supporting refugees and employment is through raising additional capital to help more SMEs and Syrian entrepreneurs. We also need soft loans and grants to support Syrian jobs and SMEs owned by Syrians and any technical assistance programs that might be uh, helping us overcome the crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Alfinas. Um, I think what you mentioned in terms of the challenges, the regulatory challenges that, that exist in Jordan regarding the refugees or the firing of uh, the, the impossibility uh, under certain uh, circumstances to, uh, to fire Jordanians. All these are the type of business environment and regulatory issues that are extremely important for uh, organizations to collectively advocate for. And this is the same in, in many different countries. And so uh, each country has its own set of circumstances and we need to be able to see within that, how we find the, the gems of those companies that are still hiring that can keep employing uh, productive employees, including refugees and host communities. We've had ourselves very good success in Jordan in terms of um, the plastics industry and, and the food industry, which during the COVID-19 actually went up because uh, in a plastic industry in Jordan, we saw that uh, there were uh, a lot of need that were uh, coming from, you know, the, the visors on the face and the plexiglass windows and all this. And so there were a renewed energy in there, uh, which created employment for both host communities and refugees, but still those companies need capital to grow. And, and this capital is, is essential for them uh, to access as well as the business development services, like you mentioned, uh, because companies that access capital need also to be able to access services, capacity building, technical assistance, so they can raise their standards, even uh, you know, hire more exports and so on. Another speaker that we have who has a tremendous experience is this, uh, in, in this issue is, uh, is uh, my good friend, uh, Khaled Kutob, who is a colleague from the uh, International Finance Corporation, which is a private sector arm of the World Bank. Khalid is a senior investment officer um, and he leads uh, financial sector engagements all across the Levant countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, he's been working on those uh, super interesting issues for uh, over 25 years now and uh, he developed uh, he works on the banking sector. He worked in several development institutions. Uh, he worked at the Standard Chartered Bank and at USAID as well. Uh, Khaled, what do you think of, of uh, what Alfinas was saying? And what's your different perspective of how we can leverage uh, the existing capital that we have in the market to try to, to, to include refugee and to have an inclusive investment strategies, you know? Uh, in Jordan, you and me have been trying to put together a specific vehicle, the investment catalyst with different partners to target refugee related companies. But there is also a lot of money in the market already that's sitting there and that is looking for investable opportunities. How do we mobilize this kind of money in the existing financial institutions and, and try to bring that towards 
very an inclusive investment strategy. Over to you, Holly. Thank you, Benj. Thank you for having me and inviting me to this very interesting event. Uh, I was asked to limit my intervention to a few minutes, so I'll be quick and fast and share with the, with the, with you and the team uh, a few insights uh, on on exactly on what you asked. So we, as the private sector arm of the World Bank, we try to promote the support uh, to refugees through the uh, different aspects and channels, especially when it comes to banking institutions and financial institutions. And uh, what we've witnessed over the last years since we started a, you know, the, the, the efforts to integrate refugees within the economies of the uh, host communities and the countries, and here we talk about Jordan, but also uh, Lebanon as well, uh, we noticed that banks as Elfin has mentioned, banks are very limited in, in what they can offer, if they can offer anything when it comes to the space of refugees, given that they are heavily regulated institutions and given that they have their own mandates and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and perception uh, to, to risk and, and uh, uh, ability to expand into these, what we call it niche markets for them, these are niche but risky markets. So what we've noticed that uh, uh, microfinance institutions are more open uh, from a mandate point of view and from an operational point of view and from an outreach point of view uh, to integrate and link refugees to the economic activity and leverage their skills into the economic activities in the, in the country of operations. And I can give a very quick example in Lebanon, for example, we did uh, a very, uh, I would say innovative structure with one of the microfinance institutions in the country, whereby we provided them with funding and as well as unfunded risk participation, whereby IFC takes part of the risk you know, of the default of any loan. So this institution went ahead and delivered uh, loans uh, small ticket loans, medium-sized ticket loans to uh, uh, refugees in the country for uh, developing their businesses, for starting their businesses, whether these businesses are in an informal sector or in the formal sector. And over two, three years, this institution in itself managed to build a portfolio of $3 million serving 9,000 loans or 9,000 refugees, which I think is remarkable. And we're trying to replicate the same thing in Jordan and, and think, as you mentioned, Benj, in, in the different structures as the, as the uh, you know, uh, the structure that you mentioned that we're working on to try to reach out to uh, SMEs and refugees who are uh, unbankable or are facing challenges getting access to funding from banks or access to funding from investment funds. Um, so th this is this is I think I think adding the private sector lens to the support of refugees is one of the most important aspects in linking refugees to the activities in the country of of, of operations, and that's what we've been trying uh, to do. Now, number of challenges that we faced is that in, in normal days pre-COVID, uh, you'll find that it's so difficult to change the perception of the uh, bank or even sometimes microfinance institutions on the credit worthiness of a refugee run or a refugee owned establishment, uh, whether formal or informal, whether it's a home based or whether it's, it's, it's a registered institution. And, and accordingly, the normal regular ways of uh, supporting banks to support a target clientele does not really work when it comes to refugees as, as we have experienced. And accordingly, we started thinking of, well, maybe it's not a matter of money, availability of money, as you mentioned, Benj, there is abundance of money in the, in the Jordanian banking sector, right? But how to mobilize this funding towards certain sectors or sub, sub segments of the market, including refugees and host communities, that's 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 the challenge here, and 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 we thought, and we I think uh, the, our experience in Lebanon that we're trying to indicate in Jordan is that if we try to shoulder the risk with the financial institution, this will give a boost to the efforts and can help in uh, easing access to finance for refugees and their own run uh, uh, businesses. Now, when COVID came. Uh, you know, it, it, the whole thing was reshuffled. The whole space was changed because 
all financial institutions generally has shifted away from their normal business dealings to more conservative business dealings. And we've witnessed that many institutions are much more focused on keeping the quality of their portfolios rather than expanding and extending new lending to clients. Or if they do extend, they extend it to their existing clients who they know very well and they know that they have a good financial standing and accordingly they manage the risks. Now, asking them under such circumstances to go and extend lending to new clients, let alone refugees, is, is a challenge in itself. So this is one of the new challenges that was created by, by, the, by the COVID uh, environment. On the other hand, uh, demand itself to, for investments and for borrowing, whether from local Jordanians or local Lebanese, if we talk about Lebanon, but in Jordan, local Jordanians, and of course, let alone uh, refugees, there has been a significant drop in the demand. And on the other side, there has been a significant drop in the appetite of financial institutions to look for opportunities or to meet demands that they receive. So, so both sides of the equations are moving apart rather than converging. And accordingly, uh, uh, Benj, as you mentioned, we're looking into new structures that we can, uh, through which we can provide needed funding and needed advisory services to meet the funding needs of uh, refugee-run institutions or those institutions that support and service refugees and at the same time shape up their capabilities through advisory services and technical assistance to make them more bankable or more investable when it comes to equity investments through PE funds. So um, I think that I uh, overstepped my, my time. So I'll stop here and happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Khaled. Uh, very, very interesting experience. And I very much appreciate the, the link uh, that you make between the refugees and the host communities, because a lot of the challenge are similar in terms of the the challenge they face, especially during the, the COVID-19 crisis. And also when you mentioned, you know, the investment into refugees or refugee-owned companies, I like to extend that, that definition a little bit. We, we talk in, um, in the bank often uh, as part of the refugee investment and matchmaking platform of refugee-related companies. And I think it's an important thing to take to, to, to keep in mind, which is that you can have companies that are owned by refugees or you can have companies that employ refugees, but you also have companies that do service refugees. And you have companies that are just located at the same location where a lot of refugees influx are coming and those companies need to be supported. And then you have companies that might actually be part of a, of a supply chain where they provide an upstream service in that supply chain where no refugees are involved, but downstream in the very same sector where that company is located, it's going to have an impact on refugees in terms of employment, in terms of services and all this. So it's really an ecosystem and we need to have that ecosystem view, but still the challenge is there when, when the demand diminish for uh, investment and the supply of good companies also diminish. That's where those kind of uh, uh, situation, we're, we're in then in the situation where you need to to counterbalance the risk because investment firms and banks, they are, they are looking at a cost benefit analysis, you know, uh, they, they have a risk threshold and we need to, to help them uh, lower these thresholds with instruments that are particular in terms of risk management, whether they are first loss facilities or uh, other issues. But we also need to make sure that the companies can grow and provide the right technical assistance. So i like to come back to uh, all of our uh, speakers that we had on the issues of employment and investment and ask all of the speakers, Scarlett and Celine and Alfinas to put your, your uh, video back on. Thank you so much. And I'm going to try to gather some of the questions that uh, we received during the panel. And uh, I'll start with uh, a question um, to uh, Celine maybe on the role of the uh, civil society organizations. Uh, UNHCR, when it's in a country and has to develop those kind of employability programs or support programs uh, to teach 
refugees new skills and help them sometime doing matchmaking between employment opportunities in the countries and uh, what the skills that they already have, or when uh, the UNHCR works with um, maybe incubation centers where uh, refugees are welcome. How do you work with CSOs and what is the role of CSOs today with the COVID-19 crisis to see an increase of the role of the civil society organization? Yes, th thank you very much for the question. Uh, and of course, the role of civil society is crucial as well. Um, I can give you an example um, of what we're doing in France, for, for example. So um, when the pandemic started, uh, we set up a coordination group uh, with our government partners, but also NGOs to talk about the challenges faced by refugees. And among the NGOs participating to the coordination group were NGOs working in the area of employment. So we work together to find solutions, how to um, facilitate the access of, for example, refugee health professionals and doctors um, to work in hospitals, you know, to, to respond to the crisis, how to um, uh, encourage the work or facilitate the work of farmers, for example, and there are some NGOs connecting farmers uh, with vineyards uh, in the Bordeaux region, for example, and it's thanks to that that also uh, the Vine harvest um, could take place, um, but we're also working uh, with NGOs, working uh, with uh, the private sector on refugee uh, incubators. Um, so yes, that that work is is very important uh, to work together and find solutions. And maybe I can mention something we've we've done, for example, uh, with the OECD. We worked on a guide on how to facilitate the access uh, to employment uh, for refugees uh, and that guide has a series of recommendations for various partners including uh, partners from uh, the NGO sector. Thank you. Thank you Céline. Uh, very insightful. I have a question for Scarlett at the Fund Partnership for Refugees. Scarlett, we had a question from uh, Daria Daviti about the employment. You talked about the, the, the uh, employment being affected by the COVID-19 crisis. This is not very surprising, right? There is nothing new under the sun. We've all been uh, confined in our home for the past many months. A lot of companies have uh, had to close and uh, people have lost their jobs, you know, and with the jobs also the health care that goes with it very often and, and the social networks that are part of this. We know that when you lose a job, if you don't have a strong social network, it's very hard to find an, another job. And so um, what are the refugees telling you about this? What are their, what are their reactions? What kind of uh, jobs they were working on? Is it mostly uh, more uh, manual jobs? Is it more uh, uh, accounting? Like what, what kind of jobs do, did they used to have and what kind of job are they losing? And what do you hear from the from the refugees themselves? What do they tell you about their experience? Sure, thanks, thanks Benjamin, and, and thanks for the question. So, um, I mean, I think that um, you know globally, we know that refugees tend to work in more um, vulnerable vulnerable sectors, sectors like the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry, in, in terms of um, in terms of who's going to be impacted by job losses. So that was certainly the scenario in the United States. So. The stat that I mentioned um, of one out of two refugees, recently re recently resettled refugees in the U.S. lost their source of income, um, that that was looking specifically at sectors like hospitality um, and, and the restaurant industry. And then um, in in more um, developing um, country contexts, refugees tend to work in the informal sector, um, and that's where we're also seeing um, um, you know acute pressure in terms of being able um, to provide for their families. So I think I think. It's you know generally it's 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 less about the positions um, that are um, more high skilled positions. So when I think about member companies and tent companies like Accenture, um, which are hiring refugees as as you know as as consultants um, and and within those roles, but it's more about unfortunately um, the employment opportunities that refugees often have when they're first coming to a country that are more service um, service industry jobs um, that that we've seen of course not only refugees being Impacted by this as a result of COVID-19, but but non-refugees as well around the world. Um, happy to share more information about um, 
the organizations actually that were surveying refugees. Um, just to say that's 10, 10 to roll is one step removed. We work with fantastic nonprofits and organizations around the world who they um, themselves are providing a range of services um, to, to refugees from the US to Colombia, um, you know, to, to Turkey. So happy, happy to share more about what those organizations saw in their surveys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scarlett. I know uh, we have only a few minutes before the end of the event, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, um, uh, Khaled and, and Alfines to, to be a bit shorter in the answer. We have a question on the financing part uh, in, uh, from uh, Yava Moini, who is asking about digital solutions uh, that are offered by mobile network operators uh, in terms of mobile payments. Um, can this provide access to finance to refugees in a way that's meaningful uh, to uh, kind of replace financial institutions that are unwilling to lend or just as a plug-in to those financial institutions? Maybe Khaled, if you could start on that. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, digital services is one of the main, one of the main channels those days for delivering and accessing uh, access to finance and uh, we as IFC we look into the digital platform be it e-payments be, be it uh, fintechs uh, to, to support and see how can we help them on both the investment and advisory sides and and so absolutely the short answer is yes absolutely now the question here is is the size of the financial intervention now uh, probably, as we all know, when, when it comes to fintechs and e-payments, there are always limitations on the amounts uh, exchanged, right? So if we're talking about small amounts, definitely, or even a bit, a bit medium amounts, if you wish, definitely these, these are very suitable channels. But if we go to the upper tickets or larger tickets, maybe we'll face some difficulties there. But the short answer is absolutely yes. Great. And I, it's, a, it's also a good place to make a small... Uh, plugins for another partner that we have, which is a Kiva um, organization, Kiva.org, which does uh, micro lending to uh, businesses and also have a uh, um, uh, refugee investment fund uh, available that they're starting. The question for you, uh, and that, that's online, uh, I'll, I'll finish the question for you regarding uh, gender. We know that displaced women are a particular group, right? And they're very often the engine of entrepreneurship in, in the countries where they settle. And so do you have any specific uh, criteria when it comes to gender targeting in your investments or are you just completely not looking into that aspect at all? Thank you, Benjamin. Actually, we are um, a gender targeted fund. We, uh, we target women and I do have around uh, one third of the, uh, the fund owned by Jordanian entrepreneurs and some and a couple of them, a couple of those women are actually Syrian migrants. So we do uh, target women and it is one, one of our uh, mandates. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to the four of you for having participated. And uh, as we're coming close to, to the end of this event, uh, I'd like to reflect a little bit on those four topics that we have heard today on entrepreneurship, uh, employment, investment, the adaptation of products and services. What I take from this is it's basically, it's a bundle, right? You cannot take one thing on its own. Uh, you cannot work just on investment if you don't work on entrepreneurship. And if you don't have the right regulatory environment for the employment, and if you don't have the right communication strategy to make sure that companies uh, want to employ uh, refugees. And you also need to consider the fact that refugees integrated with host communities present real market opportunities that can, be, that, can, that can be tackled by the private sector. So we really have a multiple role of the private sector. And what we saw today, I find, is that beyond the knowledge that we all bring in and the case studies and what happened in, in uh, this refugee camp where we saw something amazing happen in terms of private sector involvement, like for instance, in, in Kakuma in Kenya, or what's happening in one particular country uh, like Colombia and how the, the Chamber of Commerce is reacting or in another one. We have so many examples, but what matters at the end are the projects on the ground and the partnership element within those projects is essential. 
because you cannot tackle investment without employment, without entrepreneurship, without considering the market of the host community and the refugees. And so since you cannot look at it with blinders, you have to partner with others to do it. And that's how by partnering, we can, I think, put real uh, projects, products, deploy or joint resources on the ground and, and really increase the, uh, the role of the private sector in economic integration of refugees. On those words, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Daphne jung -Derby from the International Chamber of Commerce to close the event. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Benj, and I think that the point of partnership is very important and the very reason why ps 4 r was actually created to form a partnership between the private and the public sector to support the private sector response. Well, my role is really to thank everybody. I have very, very big speakers, which are amazing speakers for sharing all their stories and really valuable insights. Um, all the experiences and ideas you've shared, uh, both uh, from the speaker side and from the audience, will be put together by PS4R and a summary will be put up on our website, as well as summarized by a bench during his pitch session at the Paris Peace Forum. Uh, I also, from, on behalf of ICC, would like to thank uh, our PSR uh, partners for their continuing support for the initiative, the World Bank, of course. Thank you very much, Benjamin, a fellow moderator, um, European Investment Bank, um, the DI, the Confederation of Danish Industry, who has been a partner for PSR right from the beginning. And thank you for Peter Help for his uh, message of support. Uh, and UNHCR, we are very grateful that um, Filippo Grande sent a message today uh, and as well that several colleagues were able to join us. And I also like to thank some very committed colleagues whose face you didn't see today, but who were instrumental in organizing this event. I want to thank Cordelia Chestnut and Julia Barrera from the World Bank, Matteo Golfetto from EIB, Caroline Infelisai and Jenny Irving from ICC, as well as many other colleagues uh, in the background who have ensured the smooth running of this event. And obviously a very big thanks to all of you for taking the time to participate today. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to engaging with you more in the future. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.